Okay, we're back in session. As was obvious from the presentation of Gordon, Dot, Margaret, and Allen, key legislators and legislative leaders were responsive to our clients' needs and greatly aided our work on our clients' behalf. Like I, and I likewise said in the introduction, a number of responsible government administrators in many cases made things work for our clients. However, the most dramatic and courageous responses to our presentation of our clients' problems came from the third branch of government, both state and federal judges. Federal district judges at one time or another saw the law and equity in the cases presented by legal services lawyers. But the one who stands out from all the rest is Judge L. Clure Martin, who had been appointed to the bench by Richard Nixon in 1969. Judge Morton was a stern East Tennessee Republican who had been an FBI agent for a time during his law career. He was learned and he was courageous, but above all, he upheld the law, whether he agreed with it or not. He was a hard taskmaster to both sides, to all sides. Soon after Judge Morton took the bench, he was called on to decide a controversial case and was required by the law to render a decision though he strongly disagreed with the result. It involved school, school busing. As a result of his decision, the judge and his wife, who had been a fixtures in Knoxville society, were shunned by both polite and impolite society in Nashville. So he and his wife moved to Cookville, where they lived until he retired in 1996, commuting to Nashville or requiring Nashville lawyers to make the trip to Cookville for court. For some of us, however, he was the example of courage, courage and integrity, and what a judge must be and do. Walt Kurtz, the entire time he was on the bench, kept a picture of Judge Morton in his courtroom on the wall at a place where he could see it, see it every day from where he sat. In the state courts, we had tens of thousands of family law cases in circuit court. We had housing and consumer cases in general sessions. But the cases with the widest impact tended to be in Davidson County Chancery Court. With the luck of the draw, much to his detriment of his workload, many of them fell to Chancellor Ben Cantrell. Chancellor Cantrell had been appointed to the bench by Governor Winfield Dunn in 1973. He was elected to a full eight-year term in 1974, and he served there until Governor Alexander appointed him to the Court of Appeals in 1980. We are pleased that he has agreed to come today and to reflect on some of the legal aid cases that came before him. Well, thank you, Jimmy Lynn, for that, but you're much too kind. Remembering that era, uh, we were all just trying to do our jobs. We were trying to do the best we could, often plowing new ground, trying to decide what we could do. Uh, and it's nice to hear the words of remembrance for Judge Morton. He had a way of making lawyers get to the point in a hurry, and that's why he could try that prison case in three days when it took us three weeks <laughs> to hear it in Chantry Court. Now, since this is a CLE program, let me give you young lawyers, uh, a little Ellie. Trial judges appreciate candor. And it seemed to me as a trial judge that you got a lot more just plain old honest uh, responses from the lawyers that had been around a good while, veteran lawyers. And I remember a, a case, one of those dreadful docket calls in Chancery Court when the clerk called a case and nobody stood up. And then he said, oh, I see, uh, I had a note here. Last doc had called that the plaintiff had died. Well, Claude Callock was in the courtroom, and Claude said, if your honor please, he's still dead. <laughs> <laughs> and there was an old lawyer named Mr. Billy Cooper, and he had tried a non-jury case, and uh, he asked the court for 90 days to file the post-trial brief. And the judge said, surely, Mr. Cooper, you don't need 90 days to file a brief in this case. And he said, well, Your Honor, I sure need the last three. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
Now, to get serious, let me say and echo what others have said, what an important book Ashley's Everyday Justice is. Not only does it tell the legal history, uh, the uh, history of legal services in Nashville, in telling that story, it becomes an important historical account of the conditions in the state institutions that had neglected for years the care of the citizens assigned to them. Also, let me say how well written the book is. I didn't know lawyers could write like that. <laughs> Looking back on it, I noticed that legal services and I arrived in Nashville at about the same time. I graduated from law school in 1966 and came to Nashville that year, a year after the federal money had become available to begin what we now call legal services, a legal services organization. As a young lawyer just trying to make a living, I was vaguely aware about all the ups and downs during the next three years before the Bar Association finally created a corporation called Legal Services of Nashville, Inc. But it seemed to me that uh, most of the noise uh, I was hearing about that <coughs> amounted to just that noise. Now, years later, there's still noise, probably in the 1990s, um, when Congress was threatening legal services with cutting off their money, and they were saying that they were just hired a bunch of radical lawyers. <laughs> I wrote a postcard to Ashley, and I said, look, Ashley, uh, this is serious, so you're going to have to get rid of some of your radicals, and so <laughs> you need to fire Russ Overby and David Tarpley. Now, uh, he didn't follow my advice. <laughs> I don't know why, but probably because I picked the two least radicals. <laughs> and some of the most respectful courtroom lawyers in town, and so we still laugh about that occasionally. Looking back over the cases I was taxed with, it still amazes me what a, press, what a mess the state's prisons were in, especially, as you have heard, when the Constitution of 1870 had Article I, Section 32, it says safe and comfortable prisons and the humane treatment of persons of prisons shall be prisoners shall be provided for. And as uh, I think Gordon said, uh, the members, some of the members of that constitutional conve convention had been in prison during the Civil War, and so the horrors of the Civil War prisons have been well documented. So it's not surprising to me that the convention incorporated Article I, Section 2 in its new constitution. What is surprising is the fact so little heed had been pay paid to it through all the years. Now, for some reason, the people of Tennessee repeal that uh, after we'd been through all the prison cases. Uh, I still don't know what the lobbying effort was that got that done, but anyway, a little, little heed had been paid to it. One of the first cases I had to hear involving legal services was the one Walter Kurtz filed concerning the Metro Jail. The old jail, of course, was a holdover from the time before the consolidation of the city and county governments. It served the city as a lockup where you got sent to sober up for four hours after you'd been caught driving under the influence. Uh, Walt didn't describe all the conditions there, but as a chancellor, I didn't get to hear much of that either because uh, early on, uh, the parties and the sheriff, Faye Thomas, was uh, represented by Bill Willis, and Walter and Bill and the sheriff decided that the only sane solution to the jail system was to build a new jail. Now, Fate Thomas was not a neophyte when it comes to uh, local politics. 
And he knew that it was better for the court to tell the county that they had to build a new jail than for him to ask for it. So that's what they did. And they, we entered a, a, an agreed order that the county would build a new jail. So that took care of that. Although I don't, I want to indicate that there were not many problems to be addressed, but uh, at least we got a new jail. And we've had one since then, I think. Another <laughs> jail, but anyway. The prison case came on to be heard in the early part of 1978 after nearly three years of discovery and pretrial motions. You've heard from Gordon how bad the conditions were across the whole system. I'll tell you just a few things that stand out in my memory. Uh, first off was just the overcrowding and the failure of the classification process. Um, Second was what we call the transit building in the main prison. Uh, poor health care was a big problem for prisoners all over the state, and especially bad conditions at the hospital in the main prison. The overcrowding and idleness produced a system where the inmates, as we have heard, left the prison work all, worse off than they were when they entered the prison. David Rabin recently wrote an article for the Bar Journal about the Tennessee correction system. Um, uh, he, he relates how the state built the new prison. You've seen the picture of that old prison uh, earlier, which they, the state built in the late 1890s. But by the time it was finished, it was already seriously overcrowded. Well, it was still there in 1978. Uh, it was a large building we remember and it consisted of cells about four feet by eight feet designed to hold one prisoner who, because the prisoners had jobs to perform, spent most of the days outside working the fields or on other jobs inside the prison. Well, in 1978, the four by eight cells contained two prisoners sleeping on a double deck bunk with a commode and a wash basin in the corner. And they seldom left the cell except going for meals or trips to the hospital. I don't remember the proof about where they went to take a bath, Gordon, but I guess they did that some, somehow, <laughs> occasionally, anyway. Uh, Remember the transit building. It was a big building located in the middle of the main prison. And it seemed to me that it was like an old uh, army barracks. It had three floors and 100 beds on each floor. Uh, the only supervision were some guards that were stationed on the ends of the, uh, each floor. But the guards seldom, never, I don't guess they ever went, in, went inside. They looked inside maybe occasionally. Um, so uh, the guards didn't know what went on inside the prison. Furthermore, because of the poor job the state did in classification, young guys facing a year in jail for peddling a little marijuana were housed with hardened criminals serving time for crimes of violence, all in the floor where they had no uh, guards supervising them. I especially remember the hospital in the main prison. The head of the hospital was not a doctor. In fact, as Ashley points out, there was not a full-time licensed physician in the whole system. The hospital had a TB ward, but the air conditioning system circulated air through all of the hospital wards. So much for safe and comfortable prisons. I also want to mention uh, the litigation that involved what we call the Taft Youth Center. Uh, any of you have ever been up 
on the mountain in Bledsoe County probably have seen the remains. I think it's closed now. But it was the main juvenile uh, detention center. The case, though, involved the conditions at all of the state's juvenile detention facilities. Boys with de de developmental disabilities and others suffering from mental problems <coughs> were not getting any special services and were frequently abused by staff members and sexually assaulted by other boys. So legal services lawyers filed a lawsuit in 1976 challenging the conditions at the several juvenile detention facilities. Two years later, as the discovery proceeded, the lawyers had to expand their request for relief as a host of other examples of abusive behavior came to light. Finally, we set a hearing on the plaintiff's request for a restraining order on a Monday in February of 1979. By this time, Bill Leach had become the state attorney general and Bob Delaney was the assistant attorney general handling that case. And to me, that seemed like a, a sort of a turning point in the way that the state approached these problems. General Leach and lawyer Delaney met with the legal services lawyers, Andy Shookoff, Russ Overby, and Austin Van Drost. And over the weekend, they rolled up their sleeves and hammered out an agreed order addressing most of the relief sought in the petition for the restraining order. Looking back on it, one of the highlights of my services as a trial judge happened when Russ <laughs> came by my office and announced that they had settled that part of the case. I don't want to leave you with the impression that that agreement solved all the problems with the juvenile detention system. As Ashley notes in the book, the case ground on for two more years before the parties reached a comprehensive agreement dealing with issues at the heart of the case. By that time, I was on the Court of Appeals. That order was signed by a new chancellor, the state had a new government, and the state population had a new attitude toward the treatment of juveniles in state custody. None of that would have happened without a dedicated and tenacious law firm pushing the narrative and suggesting a remedy. So looking back over the ensuing 50 plus years, I don't think any other organization or firm could have accomplished what legal services did. Can you imagine a law firm taking a case that was gonna last the next eight years? Uh, I don't think that would have been re received. But the lawyers at legal services believed in what they were doing and doggedly and respectfully pursued their goals. Back then, even as a young lawyer, and even now, when anybody tells me about somebody who needs legal help but can't afford it, I'm happy to be able to say, you need to have them contact Legal Aid. Thank you. I'm so proud to have been a part of this organization. From the earliest years through all the years of our story, the most consistent support of the organization and of the cases <clears throat> handled by the lawyers came day after day story after story, editorial after editorial, in the Tennessean newspaper. The afternoon newspaper, The Banner, in the early days was not supportive. However, in the early 1970s, while a certain John McLemore was the paper's reporter covering the federal courts, we did get some good stories and some good pictures. And after the ownership of the paper changed in the 1980s, the paper did support legal aid. The support of the Tennessean was so consistent and so staunch, however, especially in hard times, and in 1981, 
the National Legal Aid and Defenders Association gave it its annual journalism award to that newspaper. One of the members of the staff who was most instrumental in much of the coverage and editorial support was Sandra Roberts, who until her retirement in 2007 was the editorial page editor of the Tennessean. What an honor it is for me today to represent the Tennessean in this particular forum. Um, the fact of the matter is, I was so lucky to be a journalist at a newspaper when newspapers were economically viable and journalists had the time and resources to do their work. Otherwise, the work I'm about to describe probably wouldn't have happened. <coughs> Editorial boards are designed to reflect the philosophy of a newspaper. The members of those boards write the editorials, uh, interview and endorse candidates, produce the op-ed pages, go through the letters, and uh, um, frequently have a Sunday section. The Tennessean's editorial board, like most, was not a democracy. John Siegenthaler was the editor for most of my time there, and he handpicked members of the editorial board, in large part uh, based on their philosophy. Could they support a, the democratic, progressive philosophy of the newspaper? Siegenthaler was extremely involved, even after he retired, truth be told, uh, with the editorial pages. He loved to write editorials himself. When he was out of town or out of the country, he had them read to him. He would sometimes insert coded messages to people in editorials. The editorial page, for the most part, focused on state and local public policy issues. So when it came to the courts, we were so lucky to have Kirk Loggins, who died earlier this year, as our court reporter. You've seen his, now you see his picture, and his byline has flashed up many times. Um, he was just the ideal reporter. First, he knew his stuff. He stayed at the courthouse all day long. He knew all the judges. He knew the janitors. But most important, Kirk was so likable that people would just tell him things. And eventually, those things would make their way, some of them, back into the pages of the Tennessean. He knew which judges left early and which prosecutors had a tendency to be a little too harsh. Kirk said after he retired that a good day at the courthouse is like going to the movies. His work and the work of other reporters at the Tennessean gave the editorial page plenty of public policy issues to write about. So naturally, when it came to legal services, uh, we wrote about it a lot. But more than that, we wrote about the legal service clients and the challenges that they faced every day, like uh, prison conditions, like mental health, like domestic violence. One of my first in-depth assignments at the Tennessean as an editorial writer was the 1984 campaign to increase uh, AFDC standards, Aid to Families with Dependent Children. It was a federal program, 70% uh, financed by the federal government, 30% by the state, but the state had total control over the management of the program. It should surprise none of you that Tennessee had the lowest standard of need in the nation. And in the early 80s, a task force recommended that the, that Tennessee's standard of need virtually be doubled. Uh, so it was you know, a great cause. Stuart Clifton and Alan Ramser lobbied it for legal aid. Many of the state lawmakers were all on board to raise the standard of need. But the Alexander administration was opposed to it. They said, it's just not a budget priority. So in 84, we launched our campaign. Susan Thomas was writing the public interest pieces. Joel Kaplan was writing the political part from the Hill. And I was writing the editorials. Uh, the late, great Frank Ritter, I must add, was our editor on most of this. Early on, we decided three things about the coverage on the AFDC story. First, we weren't going to use the word welfare unless we had to use it in a quote. If we just couldn't get away from it. Second, and this was trickier, we tried not to use the acronym AFDC because nobody knew what it really meant or what it did, but they knew that it was welfare. Uh, and third, and this was the trickiest of all, 
we tried not to pressure Governor Alexander. The newspaper at that point had a very good re uh, relationship with him, and we thought if, this, if we just let this play out a little bit, he's gonna wanna do the right thing. So instead of pressuring the governor, we put a lot of pressure on the Commissioner of Human Services, Sammy Lampewitt. As the weeks went on, and we're writing, writing and writing, um, it became more absurd not to put Alexander on the hot seat. Everybody knew that it was his policy. So it got to be April. Uh, the, it, the, um, thanks to Stewart and Allen, legislators, there were 31 legislative sponsors for raising the standard of need. The clergy had signed on to it. The social workers had signed on to it. So finally in April, we thought, this is ridiculous. We've got to start hammering the governor. And I wrote this barn-burning editorial. It was, I thought it was brilliant. I was 33 years old, what did I, but I thought it was brilliant. Uh, calling on, putting it personally on Governor Alexander. I wish I had kept a copy of that editorial because it never saw print. <laughs> Late that afternoon, Joel called from the Hill. The governor had said, okay, I'll sign it. I'll put it in my budget. And we thought, yay, what a good job we did. I've always imagined there was a telephone conversation between the editor and the governor, but I'll never know. So we won the fight, and I was naive enough to think that all subsequent fights would go our way eventually. Little did I know. Some years later, when I was preparing to take over as edit editorial page editor, Siegenthaler went through his papers and dug out some uh, documents from the 1930s when the Evans family bought the Tennessean out of receivership. He wanted to see what they had to say about what they wanted the Tennessean to stand for. And there were really only two things. One, we were gonna stand for um, free markets, easy enough. The second one was, said that um, we had to remember every day that all human problems are made infinitely worse by poverty and that we had an obligation to reflect the lives of the people who couldn't afford to buy the newspaper. So that carried us through the FDR's New Deal legislation, LBJ's Great Society, so when it came to legal services, this was in our DNA. There was never any question about what we were gonna do. It was just a matter of who was gonna write the editorial. And we also had, there was also a, a issue of tone. Um, we always made two arguments. One is support for legal services and their clients is just a matter of justice. It's the right thing to do. But we also remembered that most newspaper readers then and now are middle or upper income, and some of them, they're busy people. So they're not bad, but some of them have just never had to reflect on the plight of the poor. So we would make the very practical argument that this is the most efficient way to do justice, to ease the, the taxpayer's burden at the courts, and, and we also pointed out that legal services is helping people gain independence so they can be taxpayers too. Through all those fights, um, people at the Tennessean, re reporters and editors knew that they could count on the staff at Legal Aid to help us explain the effect of poverty. I can't tell you how many tutorials I've had through the years from Gordon Bonneman on 10 care in prisons in particular. But in the end, we knew that we were writing about people who were doing the real work. So we were writing about the people at Legal Aid who were in the trenches every day. Nevertheless, their successes, and they've had many of them, still are a great source of pride for me. Thank you. Well, a lot of people had a strong reaction against this revolutionary idea of providing uh, legal services to poor people, and a strong reaction against uh, some of the changes that resulted. And it stands to reason that uh, when you give people access to courts and legislators and administrators, people who had 
not previously had that access, that you bring about a change in social arrangements. And the people who were comfortable in the prior social arrangements are going to react. In this part of the program, I'm going to talk about uh, several of the reactions, uh, three of them national efforts to get rid of or hamper our work, uh, and the others uh, expressions of local opposition. And I'm going to talk about some of the good things that resulted uh, in spite of these. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, the $95,000 grant that uh, Lewis Pride and, and uh, Billy Howard got uh, in 1968 was just in time. Because the next month in Washington was inaugurated uh, the President Richard Nixon, whose administration then uh, set out to abolish OEO and to abolish everything that had anything to do with President Johnson's great society, including legal services. Cognizant of this opposition, the American Bar Association had begun early on this campaign to get legal services out of uh, OEO and to establish a separate corporation uh, to sort of insulate it uh, from uh, other things. And in 1972, Congress passed a bill uh, and, and sent it to the president, uh, but he vetoed it. Uh, then two years later, amidst all the chaos of Watergate, they passed it uh, again, despite an attempted filibuster by uh, Senator Jesse Helms and our own Senator Bill Brock. Uh, Congress passed and sent it to the president, and in one of his last acts before he got on the helicopter and went away, the president signed it. The ABA had hoped that uh, by establishing the corporation as an independent corporation, it would insulate legal services from some of the political pressure uh, and political questions, but as we know now, uh, it done, did not happen. Next example is a, a local opposition, uh, and it has to do with the uh, Commissioner of Welfare during the 1970s, Fred Friend. Commissioner Friend was uh, angry with legal aid because we had sued him five or six times over um, issues to do with the administration of uh, welfare. Uh, specifically uh, the time limits to uh, deal with applications, appeals, um, recruitment of overpayments, and, and the like. All those cases uh, based on the department's violation of federal regulations. Commissioner Friend uh, decided that since we received funds from the United Givers Fund, UGF, that he would appear before the board and see if he could get us defunded by UGF for what uh, for filing those and winning uh, those lawsuits because he was angry uh, uh, about it. I was invited and one of the board members, Joe Cummings, uh, came uh, to answer his uh, contentions. I spoke very briefly and introduced Joe Cummings uh, Joe was a scion of an old Nashville family, a partner in the second largest uh, law firm in Nashville, and uh, he spoke to the board, many members uh, he knew, and he was very forceful um, and said uh, clearly that we were doing what we were supposed to do, and he stood behind us 100%. Well, as a result of what I think was uh, Joe Cummings' uh, statements to the board, they totally rejected uh, Commissioner Friend's attempt to defund us. Well, it worked that time, but six years later, uh, we did not fare so well. Uh, it, in 1980, we managed to uh, offend uh, the automobile dealers, thanks to Jimmy Lynn and Dave Tarpley, uh, the hospitals, all of them, thanks to Gordon and Stewart and Mary Walker, and a bank, uh, thanks to the lawyers in our Gallatin office. Once again, Joe Cummins uh, came to our defense, but despite his eloquent uh, defense and good support, 
uh, from the community and a chiding from the morning newspaper. Uh, the, this time, the United Way bowed to its major donors uh, and our funding uh, was cut. The good news was that the next year with the change in management at the, uh, at the United Way, we got our funding back. Uh, more good news was the lawyer-like way uh, that the Nashville Bar Association responded to these, this controversy and many others at that point. The United Way and the automobile dealers wanted the Bar Association to look into our, quote, overzealous handling of various matters. And this fell into the lap then of Richard Byrd, who was the outgoing president. He took it on himself to do, do an investigation and, and wrote up a, a report uh, in which he endorsed the board, most of whom had been had been uh, appointed by the NBA, and he cited a formal opinion of the ABA talking about the independence of the lawyer, that the third party cannot interfere with that, neither the board nor the bar association, uh, and it finally cited uh, federal regulations and, and statutes about uh, client eligibility. It was the kind of precise work that makes one proud to be a lawyer. Uh, we were developing a stronger relationship with the NBA every day, and we would need that for what lay ahead uh, in Washington. President Ronald Reagan and his administration came to office in 1981, determined to get rid of the Legal Services Corporation. Uh, less than a month after they took office, uh, they proposed to uh, to uh, modify the federal budget and zero fund uh, the Legal Services Corporation. In response, the ABA once again uh, mounted an impressive lobbying uh, effort with Congress and locally the NBA board unanimously opposed the administration's proposal to get rid of us. Chancellor Robert Brandt drafted a letter of support signed by 17 local trial judges and sent that to the congressional delegation. And in the end, with bipartisan support in the Congress, LSC survived, but its funding was severely cut and uh, consequently ours was cut. The, even with that, the administration was not finished uh, and it had the power to appoint the board of the Legal Services Corporation. And using uh, recess appointments, it installed people who were opposed to legal, uh, legal services and open, openly campaigned for its uh, demise. Uh, they made every effort to impede our grants and to disrupt our services. It was a long and gruesome eight years. Uh, because of the funding cut, we lost nearly half our staff. We went from 33 lawyers at the beginning to 17 lawyers at the end. The good news was that those who could stay continued to zealously represent their clients. And two good things happened in the 80s uh, in spite of it all. First, when it became obvious that we would lose staff and we would not be able to handle the number of cases that we had before, the Nashville Bar Association established a pro bono program. Uh, the admonition of the rules that uh, lawyers uh, and ensure equal access to our system of justice is not new. It was in the canons before, in the code uh, after that. What was new in the 1980s was the orderly administration of that responsibility, and that's what an organized pro bono program uh, provided. The second good thing uh, that happened was our annual fundraising campaign. By the mid-'80s, we finally figured it out uh, that at legal services, we could no longer re just depend on federal funding, and we needed to <coughs> diversify. We applied for different contracts and, and grants, but we also figured we needed a local fundraising campaign. We could no longer rely simply on the United Way for local funding. 
Now, I have to say that we went into this with some skepticism and self-doubt. We were not the most popular group in town. Uh, we were lawyers. Uh, we sued people. We represented low-income people in controversial cases in unpopular areas. But we made a brilliant choice at the beginning. We asked Charlie Warfield to head the campaign. Warfield not only was uh, one of the founding partners in a large law firm in town, he was also, he'd also been president of the Chamber of Commerce. He'd raised money for the Red Cross. He'd raised money for Vanderbilt Law School. And he was chair of the executive committee of the board at Fisk, active in the community. One of the things he insisted was that we not limit ourselves uh, to just asking lawyers, said others in the community needed to help. We'd concentrate on lawyers, but everybody had a stake in justice for all. And under his leadership, we exceeded our goal that first year by nearly 20%. And for the next 25 years, Warfield was on the executive committee of, of the Legal Aid Society, and he recruited the campaign chair for those successful campaigns every year thereafter. He taught us that fundraising is friend raising. And it turned out we needed all the friends we could get. More trouble ahead in Washington. And this is what led to the formation of the Tennessee Justice Center. For this crisis, the Tennessee, Tennessee Bar Association took the lead. Long story short, we decided at the Legal Aid Society that despite everything, we could still do most of the things we'd been doing and that we would find it hard to replace the grant. It was a million dollars a year. And so we decided to stay with that. Gordon and Michelle Johnson, however, had complex cases that they could not refer to other people even if they could find somebody who would take it, uh, which in itself was doubtful. And so they had to have a place to go. Ronnie Green, who had been active in pro bono uh, locally and statewide, was the president of the T TJC board for the first 10 years of its existence. And he recalled the cre its creation. The Tennessee Bar Association presence at the time First Harris Gilbert, then Howard Bogle, 1995 into 1995-96. Uh, in order to have an organization that could that could be a vehicle to for Gordon Bonneman, uh, who was going to be leaving the legal aid organization because of the restriction on class action litigation. So uh, those two bar leaders organized kind of what I think it was a summit at the bar association headquarters on West End. I remember being there, uh, you know, with the Tennessee Pro Bono Program, which it, I think I was I was the outgoing chair of, and um, and others, and in conjunction with the Tennessee Bar Foundation, which administered the state's IOLTA program, everybody agreed that the bar should support organized bar should support and provide some leadership to the Tennessee Justice Center to to kind of help the work that the Legal Aid Society had been doing. But now, one part of it would be done by this new organization called the Tennessee Justice Center. Part of, of, of that support for the Tennessee Justice Center was, um, you know, again, having some people who were familiar with the pro bono programs, uh, who, had, who had served with uh, maybe the pro bono committee with the Bar Association. So I recall uh, a conversation with, with Howard Vogel. He, he thought it might be a good idea if I could, uh, if I could support Gordon, I would, I would be in Nashville there. I could uh, keep an eye on Gordon. <laughs> and so, um, so I got to know Gordon and uh, start, was the first board chair. And uh, I know we, I think there was a presentation that Howard made that first uh, December to the Bar Foundation, which was successful. And, and off we went with Gordon and the new lawyer from New York, Tennessee, Michelle Johnson. Well, that young lawyer of 27 years ago is now the executive director of the TJC. Is Michelle here? Where is she? she was. Uh, and under her leadership and with the fundraising leadership of Frank Garrison has established 
just this year, the TJC in the heart of the Napier Sudicum community on Lafayette Street in Nashville, where TJC is becoming not only a vital part of that community, but also serving clients statewide. Over the years, the work of TJC has expanded. It's not only the big lawsuits anymore. We do three things at Tennessee Justice Center. We help individuals, uh, about 2,000 individuals call us from Memphis to Mountain City. And over the course of two years, we, we have clients from every single county. Um, this year, I think we've already helped clients in 80 counties. And we help them through these complicated systems to access the services they need to thrive. We help them access healthcare, nutrition, um, and we help them with medical debt help seniors get the long-term care they need and pregnant moms get access to prenatal care. And through those 2,000 uh, cases, we see patterns. And those patterns are what we use to figure out how we can address system change and um, make a difference for uh, families who've never heard of us. And so um, we also found that because we have a thimble full of resources and an ocean full of need, we found that we have to leverage our little bitty resources by doing trainings. And so we do about 100 trainings a year for other nonprofits, um, churches, healthcare providers, food pantries, to kind of make sure they understand the threats and opportunities and the workarounds so that when they see a low-income person, they know what they can do to make sure that they have their basic needs uh, met. And often those partners then call us for technical assistance or call us with a system issue. And so between the you know, trainings, which I think last year we trained about 7,000 people and the clients, we see, we get a full uh, idea of what's happening on the ground to low-income families so we can prioritize what needs, uh, what needs to be addressed. And so our system work includes leading the Coalition for Medicaid Expansion, which would have expand health coverage to 300,000 working Tennesseans. It includes a big court case that would restore health coverage to 100,000 Tennesseans. So this brings us up to date about some of the challenges and opportunities <clears throat> during those pivotal years, uh, except for the one organization that has been the constant uh, in all of that, the Legal Aid Society. We'll now hear from Dar Kenya. Uh, Dar Kenya Waller, who's the current executive director, uh, who with the board and the staff and pro bono lawyers uh, continues to provide services to thousands of people every year. Dar Kenya. In 2024, Legal Aid Society will celebrate 55 years in existence. It's hard to believe that a ragtag group of lawyers passionate about the needs of low-income Middle Tennesseans could have evolved into Tennessee's largest nonprofit law firm. And while mergers and growth have been the hallmark of the last 20 years at Legal Aid, there is one unwavering truth. The spirit of Legal Aid lives on. During the Great Resignation, there was a bit of a changing of the guard where the trailblazers of the past gave way to a new generation of Legal Aiders who are determined and resolute in their righteous indignation to stand for the least of these, even against the seemingly crippling effects of the late 80s and 90s. As an organization, we continue to serve 48 Middle Tennessee counties through our eight offices, but struggle to accomplish, uh, but struggle to accomplish this remains. There is only one legal aid attorney for every 8,000 people who are eligible for our services. A 2022 Justice Gap report of the Legal Services Corporation shown that 92% of the substantial civil legal problems of low-income Americans were not met. These are things like food, shelter, safety, for which only 8% of low-income people actually receive adequate legal representation. At Legal Aid, we practice in a myriad of areas of law that we work to determine annually are the greatest needs of low-income, elderly, and vulnerable community members. While we are unable to pursue class action lawsuits or lobby for particular legislative actions without a specific request for such, 
We leverage our vast client base to advocate for systemic changes that can lead to better lives for our neighbors. For example, in 2011, legal aider Jean Crow met with then judge Philip Smith and former Mayor Carl Dean with the hopes of establishing a citywide domestic violence safety and accountability assessment to determine the holes in our system when it comes to domestic violence. The conver that conversation resulted in over 100 community members volunteering to evaluate and find ways to improve domestic violence, um, domestic violence victim safety and offender accountability. The findings published in a 2013 re uh, report resulted in a citywide domestic violence coordinator the city's first court-based family justice center called the Gene Crow Advocacy Center located in the Ben West building, the addition of a new city department in, the Na in Nashville city government called Metro's Office of Family Safety, and the largest family justice center in North America located just beside the new police headquarters on Murfreesboro Pike. In 2022, I had the pleasure of working with Councilwoman Zolfat Sarara to establish the city's first eviction right to counsel program. This program substantially increases the resources dedicated to ensuring more tenants have access to legal representation and more educational materials were developed to ensure that landlords and tenants better understand their rights and responsibilities. Through our work on this program, we now man uh, the, the Metro Courthouse on eviction days, giving real-time legal representation and advice to persons walking into court. We help Judge Rachel Bell's housing court offering eviction court on site in the public housing uh, units. We've saved residents more than $3 million through obtaining rent relief, avoiding court costs and fees, and preserving affordable housing. In 2017, when TenCare mailed out thousands of packets of information to individuals in order to redetermine their eligibility for TenCare, thousands of seniors and vulnerable Tennesseans were cut off when they did not receive, could not navigate, and therefore did not return the 98-page packet that was necessary for them to keep their benefits. Much of the information required in the packet was a restatement of in information TenCare already had. The problem was discovered when legal aider Amy Luna in our Murfreesboro office discovered that several of her el elderly clients had significantly less Social Security benefits or had been denied their medications at the pharmacy. We partnered with the Tennessee Justice Center to help create a streamlined process within TenCare to overturn some of the denials within a week. The wording on the front of the envelopes was modified to ensure that recipients knew that the packets were important to not only their TenCare benefit, but also their Medicare benefits, since both Medicaid and Medicare were being administered through the TenCare office. It also helped to push along TenCare's deployment of a new eligibility system that is projected to pre-populate many of the 98 pages of information and to better streamline the redetermination process. From 2000, from 2000 to 2021, the Low Income Taxpayer Clinic at Legal Aid has produced over $50 million in client financial benefits. These financial benefits are derived from settled debts, removed debts, and the release of frozen refunds for low income taxpayers. In 2022, this program represented over 20,000 taxpayers in Tennessee and helped secure $6.7 million in refunds to these low-income Tennesseans. And that does not even include decreasing or correcting $62 million in tax liabilities. Led, led by legal aider Mary Gillum in our Oak Ridge office, for over 20 years, Legal Aid's low-income taxpayer clinic is the nation's foremost taxpayer clinic. And an often invited presenter and trainer for the IRS at, a national, at national and international trainings. In 2014, Legal Aid hired Skadden Fellow and now former Legal Aider Vidi Joshi to launch a reentry advocacy program. Her acumen and tenacity laid the foundation in Nashville for the significant expungement and civil rights restoration that we've seen flourish throughout the state. 
as an ambassador for the civil rights restoration of the formerly incarcerated, she was a one-woman force meeting with community partners, governmental leaders, and the legal community, exposing the importance of clearing records of those nonviolent offenders who had already paid their debt to society. Through her advocacy and those who support and those who support she enlisted, she helped us all to see the importance of investing in this community of neighbors. Legal services to the poor is an evergreen need and has been, and has been um, as you've seen from the presentation here today. To quote the Bible at John 12, 8, the poor will be with you always. This is why the support of the private bar is so crucial to the work of legal aid. We would love for you to join us in this important work and be a part of the change that we'd like to see. There are many benefits to doing so, including free CLE, malpractice insurance, litigation expenses, screened clients, and of course, the good juju that comes from helping folks. We encourage you to be, get involved with the Legal Aid Society by going to our website at las.org forward slash volunteer. The future at LAS is bright. The opportunities to change lives are immense. There are new and different ways to take advantage of the poor developing daily, which means the need for defenders of justice only grows. Connect with us, help us. Help us to continue to fill the promise of equal justice under the law. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming today. And as I said, I, I just am so proud, as I know most of the people who've spoken today, we're so proud to be part of this organization in some small part. And we're glad that you were here to share in a part of Nashville's legal history. Those who were there in the beginning worked very hard to help people who had not previously had access to legal representation. And they had some laughs and a lot of camaraderie during the process. As I said in the beginning, this program was based on the wonderful storytelling of Ashley Wiltshire in his book, Everyday Justice, published by Vanderbilt Press. A representative of the press will be available in the hallway with copies of the book for you to purchase as you exit. The book is also available um, as an ebook or an audio book. If you would like CLE credit, please make sure that you leave your completed form on the table as you leave. We thank you for coming and have a good rest of the day. <laughs>